everybody able to see the full screen presentation? Yep. Okay. Yes, I realized I had myself on mute now. So. All right, we're gonna give folks a few more minutes to log in since we also just got this started and then I will get us going. All right, the participants, the uh, entries have been a little stagnant, so I'll just get going so we can still have some time for a Q&A this morning. Um, well, welcome everyone that's on the call um, or whoever might be watching this recording. Um, thanks for joining us this morning or this afternoon, depending on your time zone, um, for the Natives Engaged in Alzheimer's Research webinar series. Uh, my name is Cole Alec, and I serve as the um, lead for the Recruitment and Engagement Corps of the Natives Engaged in Alzheimer's Research, which will be referred to as NEAR project. Um, I'm a citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians, um, and I've been doing this work for the last couple of years, and so I'm, I'm super excited about our presentation today. Um, really excited about the energy that these two presenters bring and just the, the content as well. Next slide, please. So I just quickly wanted to go over the Zoom features today. So on the bottom of the screen, you should see a chat option where you can send messages to all participants, or you can send a message directly to the hosts. Um, we have a raise your hand feature, but we ask that you hold your questions until the end. We have a designated Q&A period. Um, so feel free to type your questions in the chat and I'm happy to moderate those or um, you can ask them as well when we get to that stage. So before we get into our presentation, I wanted to provide a brief overview of iReach, which is the institute in which um, me and my colleagues on near work. And then Dr. Adamson and Elena Seep will give their presentation, uh, telling our own stories, power of community partner data and improving aging outcomes for our elders. And then as I mentioned, we'll end with the 10 minute Q&A session or hopefully have about 10 minutes. Um, we'll also have a recording of this webinar available as soon as um, we finish today. And so that can be accessed through our main page and on the NEAR website, as well as on our iReach website. And so that email will come um, out from our group um, with that link to those who registered. Next slide. Well, thanks, Grace. <clears throat> iReach at Washington State University challenges the status quo and advances community health through partnerships and collaboration. We conduct research with rural, native, um, and Latinx populations, health networks, as well as populations with substance use disorders. Our iReach faculty belong to various colleges at Washington State University, and we partner with external collaborators at universities across the country, such as for NEAR. Uh, we actually partner with University of Miami and um, BYU Hawaii as well. Um, iReach houses three primary research programs, including Native Health, uh, which is formerly known as Partnerships for Native Health, the Northwest Health Education and Research Outcomes Network, known as Northwest Heron, which aims to improve the quality of clinical care and reduce health disparities in communities across Washington and surrounding areas. And then we also have a focus on um, Latinx health and advancing health through the formation of community partnerships and focused academic research. Next slide. The work we do with Native communities is focused on conducting community-based research and education to improve health and reduce health disparities among American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. We do this work by working with both community and academic partners in community settings. We focus on achieving health equity, community outreach and engagement, and training and education. We have 160 partners across the country, which include Entities like tribal colleges, native organizations, tribal nations, universities, and satellite centers. 
To do this work, we emphasize tribal sovereignty by responding to community needs and requests for research priorities. And we work to ensure that tribal data is protected and that community is present and engaged in all stages of the research process. I'm now gonna shift gears just slightly and give you some background information on the parent grant, which is the Natives Engaged, Natives Engaged in Alzheimer's Research. So the NEAR project is a multi-site, multi-principal multi investigator initiative that is bringing together tribes, academic institutions, urban Indian programs, and native community groups together to address Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. NEAR aims to understand, intervene on, and mitigate ADRD health disparities experienced by American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islander communities. Further, this research team includes investigators and project leads from these communities. As part of the overall NEAR program, the Recruitment Engagement Corps, which our, our team here at iReach leads for this webinar, uses strategies designed to stoke interest in research and treatment advances, both in communities participating in this project. These strategies come from those recommended by the National Institute on Aging for recruitment and retention in ADRD research. We partner with a network of community partners, including satellite centers, which are also led by American Indian, Alaska Native, or Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander investigators, which represent a diverse cross-section of academic and community partnerships. When we are out in community, we largely do this work via brain health workshops. These brain trains, as we call them, um, are hands-on educational workshops for community members that utilize visual and interactive learning methods. Some activities include self-administered tests of cognition, grip strength measurement, and blood pressure checks. If this is something that your community is interested, please reach out to us via contact info on the final slide of today's presentation. So specific to today, another part, another activity that our um, grant lets us do is to host quarterly webinars on cognitive impairment, caregiving, dementia screening, and other topics that are important for our community partners when they're addressing ADRD. Today is one of those webinars. And as I mentioned, we are really, really excited for our presentation. So I would now like to introduce our presenters, uh, Dr. Colette Adamson and Elena Seep. Dr. Adamson is a faculty member and the director of the National Resource Center for Native American Aging at the University of North Dakota. She's enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. Elena, Elena Seep is a project specialist for the National Resource Center on Native American Aging at the University of North Dakota. We are delighted to have both of them share their expertise today. Um, they're my relatives from North Dakota, so I'm um, originally from there, so it's always nice to see people from back home. But welcome, Dr. Adamson and Elena, and feel free to go ahead and um, share your slides. Thanks, Thanks Cole. Um, having trouble getting my my um camera on for some reason i'm i'm clicking on the video but it's not coming up no worries if it doesn't pop up we at least have your photo which is good okay thanks um okay can you see the slides yes yep, okay. we can see them yes Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, as Cole said, my name is Colette Adamson. Um, and today, Elena and I will be talking to you about uh, honoring our elders through data and the importance of data and supporting aging needs in Indian country. Um, first, I'd like to start off by giving you um, a little history of our resource center. Uh, so our resource center, you can see uh, 25th anniversary. We celebrated that in 2019, but it's a it's a really nice uh, logo that they developed for us. Um, but we were established in 1994, so we're a 20 year 29 year center, and we are funded through a cooperative agreement with the Administration for Community Living. We're located at the University of North Dakota at the Center for Rural Health at the School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and. We do have two sister centers that we work with collaboratively um, with in Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, part of our mission is to identify health and social needs of elders um, that include American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiians. 
Um, and through our resource center, some of the main things that we do, we serve as a resource, but we provide education and training opportunities um, through our curriculums, which we have the Native elder caregiver curriculum and the well-balanced uh, curriculum. And then we also provide technical assistance through our needs assessment surveys that we conduct, um, including our Title VI needs assessment and our urban Indian elder needs assessment. Um, and the intent of that is to utilize that information to improve the quality of life and delivery of related support services to our Native aging population. Uh, so one of our main projects that we conduct, as I mentioned, is our Title VI needs assessment, which is identifying our needs, a survey of elders. Um, and the way we do this is we partner with Title VI programs and tribal communities. And Title VI is the nutrition support services and caregiving services programs that uh, are specific to our tribal communities and for our tribal elders. And so every three years, they have to apply for this funding um, through ACL. And part of their requirement for this application is to conduct a a health and social needs assessment or community needs assessment with their tribal elders. So we work with um, those Title VI programs. And of course, this survey serves a lot of purposes, including fulfilling that grant requirement, but also providing the ability for those communities to document and assess the needs of their elders within their tribal communities. Um, like I mentioned, these surveys take a place on a triannual cycle, so it's every three years. And part of the purpose of the survey as well is to identify those gaps and needs and services for our elders within those communities. Um, it also provides information on health and social needs trends. Um, this is a cross-sectional uh, survey study. So um, as I mentioned, we do it every three years. It's not necessarily longitudinal, but we still can gather important information and look at trends with health and social disparities within our community. So looking at uh, certain areas to see if they've improved, if they remain stagnant, or they've become worse. And some of the tribes that we work with have actually participated in eight cycles of data. So um, as I mentioned, our, our center started in 94, but we started the survey cycles in 1999. So that's over 24 years of data collected through these eight cycles. And some of the, the Title VI programs and tribes have participated in every cycle. So they essentially have eight cycles of data that they can look at to see if there's any trends within their data. But overall, this survey has given um, a unique picture for each tribal community because a lot of national data sets, they don't disaggregate the data or they lump us into other or um, overall American Indian, Alaska Native and just kind of combine and don't really disaggregate our data by tribe. And so what makes this different is we're working with each community where they're collecting their specific data that represents their Native elder population. So I know a lot of times they put us under the same umbrella of American Indian, Alaska Native, but as we know, we're diverse in our needs, our communities are diverse. We have some similarities, but our cultures are different, our traditions are different. Um, we have over 570 for re federally recognized tribes, not to mention the state tribes that we have, state recognized tribes. So there's a lot of diversity within our tribes. So that's why it's that more important that community needs assessments such as these are being done at the community level. So you can identify those, our populations within our tribal community specific needs so we can address them appropriately. So now I'm gonna talk about our survey process overall. So first and foremost, when we have a Title VI director contact us about participating, we do ask for a tribal resolution. And so, as I mentioned, all of our communities are diverse. So some tribes have different tribal leadership structures. Some have our traditional uh, tribal chairperson, tribal council people set up. Some have a governor. Um, some have a president, 
Some we work with are through intertribal councils, consortiums, corporations. So we work with each uh, tribal community to identify who has the authorization to provide permission for the community to participate with, with the survey. In addition to that, um, a lot of our tribes are looking more closely at data sovereignty, research sovereignty, um, due to the historical traumas that have happened in the past uh, with people coming in and you know, conducting surveys or doing even more intense research with, with our populations, and then some of that having traumatic effects on our populations. Um, so we want to make sure that there's respectful research going on and our tribal communities are looking at that data sovereignty and research sovereignty where they're wanting to govern how the data is collected or research happening within our tribal communities, what happens to that data, ownership of that data. So we try to respect all of that. Um, and some of the tribes have developed tribal IRBs or institutional review boards, our research review boards that we work with as well. So if there is a tribal IRB in that community, mm -hmm. we work with that tribal IRB, we do the application process, we present in front of the board, we answer any questions that are needed, and um, we work with the Title VI director to work through that process. So once we get tribal the tribal resolution, um, the elder or the tribal uh, Title VI director asks us um, for surveys. So we ask them for their elder count, which is the number of elders that are eligible for Title VI services within that service area. We put that number into a statistical formula, which pops out a number that's a recommended number for a good generalization of uh, the elder population within that community. Now, with especially this last cycle with challenges with COVID and collecting this information and, and doing the surveys, we always tell the Title VI directors, if you can't reach that number, that's just a recommended number. Just collect what you can and we'll process that data for you so you have the information for your Title VI survey or grant application, I'm sorry. Um, because also these Title VI directors were so many Hats. They're cooking in the kitchen, they're delivering meals, they're writing reports, they're doing surveys. I mean, so they have a lot of hats to wear. So we try to work and be flexible with each community and each Title VI program. So we'll send the surveys out to the Title VI directors and their staff. We provide a couple of guides. One is to how to get started, um, walks them through the whole process. The other one is how to interview your elders, which kind of walks through some helpful um, tips on, you know, where to go to interview your elders for privacy, um, some definitions uh, for some of the responses on the survey. So for example, if an elder says, well, what is adult daycare? Because um, we ask them if they're now using or would use that service. And so we have those definitions where um, the Title VI director or their staff can explain what those responses mean. Segwaying into that, we do ask the Title VI directors and their staff to administer the survey because we work with uh, over 200 Title VI tribal Title VI organizations. So um, it would be really difficult to go out to all of those communities to collect the data. So that's why this is a true partnership with the Title VI program because they're essentially becoming the researcher, they're collecting the data, they're administering those surveys with their elders. Now, a lot of the Title VI directors ask us, you know, is there a certain way we have to collect the data? We do recommend that they administer face-to-face -face with the elder, but like I said, there's unique challenges in each community. The Title VI director wears many hats, so at times they might do the interviews over the phone, they might um, deliver the survey with a home delivered meal and pick it up the next week. The elder might take it on their own or with a caregiver or family member. They might mail out the surveys. Um, they'll give them out during congregate meals. One Title VI director shared that they had went on a on a trip somewhere um, on a bus and so they handed out the surveys to the elders to take on that bus while they were driving to their destination. So once they're done with um, collecting all the surveys, they send it to us, we process the data, and then we give them their results through a comparison sheet, which provides their tribal data, and then the tribal aggregated data, which is all of the elders who participated in that certain cycle, and then non-Native elder data, 55 and older, where they can have those comparisons to see um, 
you know, how they compare to those other groups to kind of identify some of those gaps. Again, circling back, the tribe owns their own data. So we never share the data out to anybody outside of the tribe. Um, if somebody, if the tribe does want somebody to have their data outside of the tribal community, what we do is we'll transfer the data to someone in the tribal community that is um, identified by a tribal leadership, and then we'll send the data to that person, and then they can share the data out to um, others that they work with if they choose. So, um Going on, so we just wrapped up our cycle eight survey. So that went from April 1st, 2020 to March 31st, 2023. And so we had over 21,000 elders participate, participants. However, um, for this certain sample, for this infographic, and we do share these infographics back with the Title VI program so they can utilize this information as well. Um, we pulled out 55 and older because some of the some of the participants were under 55, but just for this infographic, we did 55 and older, which is a sample of 19,744. Um, so as you can see, a majority of the re respondents were female at 64% compared to 36% for male. Um, Self-rated quality of life majority of our elders said that they rated their self quality of life good at 35.2 percent um, socialization in the past month so one one data point that looks a little concerning to me is the zero time so we had almost a fifth of our elders who did not get out and socialize within that month and then you can see um the, the next most reported was one to two times per month, which was 22.4% and three to four times per month at 22%. Um, then we see cultural practices and traditions. So we asked the elder what cultural practices and traditions that they engage in and they could answer, have more than one response. So um, the top identified uh, engagement in cultural practices was Powell's at 28.9%. Consuming cultural traditional foods at 24.9%, and then uh, preparing cultural traditional foods at 19.9%. The elders were also asked um, the last time they had visited a certain health professional. So in the past year, 66.2% had seen their optometrist, 21% had a hearing test, and 53.3% had seen their dentist. The top three health conditions for this cycle, which have been the same, the same over the past, I would say eight cycles, is um, high blood pressure, arthritis, and diabetes. Now, um, the the top ones probably change positions, but it's always been these three chronic conditions that have been identified the most by our elders. So, fifty eight point two percent reported high blood pressure. 44.8% arthritis, and then diabetes, 40%. Um, I'm just going to pick out a few more data points on this infographic. So 8.7% of our elders said that the biggest barrier for getting medical care was that they waited too long for an appointment. Um, cognitive issues, so we broke that down to for them to identify which cognitive issue they had been diagnosed with from their doctor. 0.7% uh, said Alzheimer's disease, 1.9% reported dementia, and 8% reported other problems with memory or thinking. <clears throat> On the next infographic, we see that 52.6% um, of our elders had one or more falls. And this is really concerning that a third of our elders who had had over or had one or more falls had injured themselves seriously enough to need medical treatment. So that's really concerning. And just the rate of falls among our elders is really concerning. Uh, difficulties with ADLs. So elders reported that they had difficulty with walking 27.9% and then bathing and showering 15.7%. Instrumental activities of daily living, uh, doing heavy housework they had difficulty with at 34.2% followed by doing light housework at 16%. Um, the elders were asked what exercise they engaged in in the past month, and the, the most reported was walking at 
followed by yard work and gardening. Um, special equipment, 31% of our elders had said that they had a health problem that required an assistive device, such as a cane wheelchair, special bed, or special phone. 29% uh, of our elders had reported being disabled with um, chronic disease being the most reported reason for the disability at 36.4%. Um, about a few years ago, we talked to a, couple, a few Title VI directors to ask them how they use their um, needs assessment data. So I just wanted to share with you a few of the things they shared with us and the three overarching themes that came out from those interviews. So first and foremost, they said seeking resources and supports. So um, of course, you know, getting their Title VI grant because the survey uh, met that requirement, but other Title VI directors had also mentioned that they were able to um, support applications for state and tribal block funding with the data. They were able to get a grant for elder abuse. They also um, had been awarded a CDC uh, grant through the REACH program. And then they also, one Title VI director talked about the National Council on Aging Stepping on Falls Prevention Initiative program, where they were able to um, get that in their community. Uh, lastly, they talked about developing partnerships with IHS. One Title VI director talked about looking at the high rates of diabetes in, within the elder population in their community. So they ended up showing IHS the results and they were able to partner with them to educate the elders on the dangers of diabetic neuropathy and on appropriate foot care for uh, diabetics. So uh, they had partnered on providing that training. The second overarching theme was uh, building collaborative relationships. So they talked about, you know, a lot of burnout in the job and they were able to talk to other Title VI directors and get ideas and talk through maybe some issues that they were having that maybe that other Title VI director had worked through and they were able to get advice from, from other Title VI directors. They also talked about being able to develop partnerships with the Minnesota Area Agency on Aging, which was, you know, their triple A in Minnesota. And then also they talked about, um, you know, just the opportunity to discuss some of these screenings that elders need. And so, for example, they would be conducting the survey with the elder and the elder would say, well, gosh, do I need this screening? Is this something I should be looking at? And so they took that opportunity to talk to them about getting certain screenings that, you know, help help with health, um, you know, prevention for disease, chronic conditions and things like that. So um, they were able to start those conversations. And then a second part of the conversation was being able to introduce and discuss advanced directives and med medical power of attorney with the elders as well. Um, the third overarching theme was evaluating and building programming. So um, one of the Title VI directors talked about looking at the lack of exercise that the elders were engaging in. So they talked to one of their staff and their staff was able to bring in a yoga program that the elders, it was very well attended by the elders from what the Title VI director had shared with us. Um, in addition to that, they were able to bring in falls uh, prevention programs that they implemented with the elders. They also talked about, um, you know, the fact that this data it's showing the needs and it's and it's evidence like that they're able to take to their tribal leadership and say, hey, here's what's going on. Here's the needs of our elders to help further um, get some allocation of funding from from the tribal leadership as well for their elders in their community. Um, so there was a lot that they shared with us about how this data and information in the survey really helped um, their elders to uh, get services for them and resources and programs. So on this, I just want to end my part of the presentation with, you know, I just wanted to share this with what the Title VI directors had shared with us and just show you that these eld uh, Title VI directors are using this data to fill the gaps and services and needs in their elder communities. But I also wanted to share with you that, you know, I read this book um, written by a First Nations researcher, and she talked about the history of the word data and how it was derived from the word datum. 
and data means something given. Uh, so as we're collecting this information and the elder, the elders are essentially sharing their stories with us, they're giving us a gift, even though, you know, it's, it's through numbers, it still tells a story with those numbers. Um, so, you know, the thought is, is that the elders are giving us this gift of data, telling us their stories. That's the gift. So what better way to honor that gift than to take that, that information and use it to advocate and raise awareness of our Native elder needs um, and to help fill those gaps to help improve the quality of life for our elders. I think that's the best way that we can look at collecting data and information and getting these stories from our elders and honoring that gift they're giving us is by using it in a good way to help better their lives. So um, that concludes my part of the presentation and I will now turn it over to Lena. Thanks, Colette. Are you gonna be my slide manager? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, one of, so thank you so much. And it's, I, I love working on the data with Colette and the opportunity to work in the Resource Center uh, because it is so important to hear right in the community, right from elders, what it is that they need, um, how they rate their health. But then there are ways that we can take that, use that data and other data resources and talk about how to build long-term services and supports for elders and people with disabilities across Indian country. If you forward the slide, please. So these are some of the statistics pulled out of the greater aggregate data that the Resource Center has collected. So 87% of elders have reported one or more serious disabling illnesses. You have almost 30% of, of, of all elders have some sort of disability, uh, including 34% of elders who are veterans are disabled. And here you can see the top list of needs. And this is pretty standard in long-term care that you find the need for transportation, home health, um, caregiving, home modifications. Um, and home modifications are really a fancy way of saying things like, do you need a wheelchair ramp? Do you need uh, counters raised or counters lowered for wheelchair access? Um, grab bars, things like that, and then physical physical therapy. So one of the reasons that we call this the public health crisis of long-term care for tribes is clearly there is a, a well-defined need. This isn't a mystery. And we have a population of elders that is increasing because why? Because tribes have taken over health care as part of their sovereign authorities and health care has improved since tribes have stepped into the Indian Health Service and, and taken over various programs like the Special Diabetes Program for Indians, tribes that have clinics, there are even some tribes that have their own dialysis units or assisted living. And so people are starting to live longer, even though there is still a disparity gap. However, what isn't really well developed is a comprehensive long-term care program to keep people what we call aging in place in their home or in a community setting of their choice for as long as possible. Slide. So this is just, a, a this is actually a piece of a bigger presentation that Colette and I have about what we call the silent public health crisis of long-term care uh, in Indian country. But this is just a snapshot of, well, why is there such an, a greater need for long-term care across tribal communities? Well, one of the things that is scientifically known is that trauma and generational trauma changes a process called methylation. Um, that is a genetic, think of it like a genetic, both a, the garbage man, <laughs> as well as an on off switch. And what trauma tends to do is switch the switch to on those gene expressions that have to do with chronic illness and disabling health conditions. So you can see generational trauma play out in a direct correlation to higher rates of disability and illness in tribal communities. And in fact, it has been a standing statistic for more than a decade that native communities have rates of disability that are three to 4% higher than the national average for any and all other population groups. Um, and then 
we're still really taking in the impacts that COVID's going to add to that. Um, the CDC released some information earlier this year as, as everyone looks back at the impact of COVID and the statistics and uh, tribal members have now a, a slide in the earlier loss of life, numbers that weren't haven't been seen since the since the World War II era, um, and it's really directly linked to COVID. Not just the impact of people uh, walking on, but also people having long COVID and being more disabled. So there's going to be even greater impacts and a bigger need for long term care. Though no one's even caught up with the data and how to manage that and how to look at that yet slide. So this is, these are just some common statistics that native populations 65 and older, that's still, even with COVID, that's still projected to double in the next 30 years. So that's not counting the people that are 55 to 64, because a lot of the census statistics and common statistics still use 65 and older. So there's going to be this increased demand for supportive services so that people can remain in the community. And out of the elders that were surveyed in the ION survey through the Resource Center, 89.7% report having at least one chronic disease, which means that their cost of care is that much higher. And to give you an idea of what that means to have um, people in those chronic and high cost of care for Medicaid as a whole, not just for native populations, but across everyone, the highest dollars spent are always on long-term care. And that population usually is between 23 to 25% of all people accessing and using Medicaid. However, they take up over 50% of the Medicaid budget, because that is how expensive it is to be sick in this country. And with, with this aging longer life, we're, we're going to see an increase in chronic illnesses and diseases such as dementia and Alzheimer's. So there's going to be a need for a higher level of support to families and home caregivers so that we can keep people in the communities. Right now, there are roughly, and this was the number the last time I checked, so <laughs> it could have changed, but there are 21, 22 uh, tribally owned and operated nursing homes to serve the entirety of Indian country. Um, there are more than a bigger number than that, but not by much of tribes that own and operate assisted living facilities. So this becomes a serious concern if you live nowhere near one of these facilities, then if you have someone that you don't have a program or services there in the tribal community to help you keep your loved one at home and well cared for, then their only option winds up being a skilled care facility, which it could be hours away from you. And it puts a strain on families, it puts a strain on the elders, and there are all kinds of statistics about lower uh, lower thriving rates, uh, poor health outcomes, simply because people are lonely and depressed and isolated because they've had to leave not just their home, but now they're far away from their families and their friends, and those people often don't have the means and resources to drive three hours one way on a regular basis to see their loved one who's in a skilled care facility. Slide. So things that, well, I mentioned Medicaid and right now Medicaid programs are the main staple of paying for long-term care for everyone, but especially for native elders. So what happens when these programs aren't being operated by tribes or tribes aren't um, part of the care management, case planning, and screening is that elders and families are having to go outside to non-tribal agencies in order to enroll in these programs. The big burden of long-term care falls to what we call Medicaid waivers. They are a subset of the overall state Medicaid programs, and they allow the state to waive the sameness rule saying, 
oh, we have to give everyone the same services. I like to call it the bologna sandwich of Medicaid because when you are enrolled in Medicaid, everyone gets the same bologna sandwich on white bread. But when you're enrolled in a waiver for long-term care supports, then you get cheese on your sandwich. So you get something extra than the general population and it's targeted at managing your chronic illness or disability in a way that helps you stay as independent as possible for as long as possible in a home or a community-based setting. So, however, these waivers, even though there are special provisions for tribal members, we found that there are all kinds of counties and including states who really have no idea that there are these special provisions. And the more that that's controlled through the state and the county and the less uh, the less access that there is for elders and people with disabilities. Most of these agency offices are located a significant different distance from reservations and in native communities. Um, then you also have not all of the forms um, that are administered or required are really in a format that especially an elder maybe understands uh, of what to answer when they're being screened. Uh, for example, we had a case of a tribe who had referred one of their elders who they absolutely knew should qualify for one of these support programs, referred her to the county for this screening assessment because that's part of the requirement is that you get screened for your functionality. So Medicaid has two pieces of um, qualification. Financial, which everybody knows about, it's that financial entitlement program, but then there's also a functional piece and that's where long-term care comes in. So that you could have someone who does not financially qualify for Medicaid, but if they functionally qualify, then they can still participate in these programs and they also reflexively get the Medicaid card. So they get the bologna sandwich and they get the cheese. But anyway, I digress. So this tribe had referred their elder um, she wasn't able to really get in and out of the bathtub by herself. She had mobility issues uh, along with some other health concerns and they referred her to the county. They didn't hear back. They followed up with their elder a week or two later and found out that she hadn't qualified. And they were stunned because there's no way that this woman shouldn't have passed the screen. And when they talked to their elder about it, they found what their elder said was, well, I didn't want to tell that stranger from the county that I couldn't get in and out of the bathtub because I didn't want her to think I was dirty. We hear stories like that all the time. And this is part of why it's so important for tribes to get involved in these assessments and screenings and to use the data sources like the elder survey to identify those people who may need extra help and may qualify for these programs. Slide. I forgot to set my timer. So if I'm too long, please somebody holler at me. <laughs> so one of the other reasons that it's important to know about Medicaid for tribes to get involved in enrolling their own people in those programs and then be the administer or administrator of those of those services is there is no IHS funding to tribes for long-term care. IHS has recognized there is a profound need for long-term care services and supports, both for elders and for people with disabilities of all ages across Indian country. The federal government, including previous administrations, as well as this current one, have recognized through ex different executive orders the need to increase capacity and access for long-term care in Indian country, and yet there has yet to be a budget appropriation to IHS funding specifically for long-term care. So right now, that is really resting on the tribes themselves, and the only real funding source out there are Medicaid waivers. So one of the things that when we do trainings with tribes, because the Older Indians Office uh, does the what they call a cluster training to Title VI programs to talk about ways to access Medicaid, ways to become that provider. And we like to start the training and ask everyone in the room, you know, does your tribe provide long-term care, Sh you know, show of hands. And usually no one raises their hand, maybe one, maybe two out of a room full of people. And then we start talking about what those long-term care services are. What's the cheese on the sandwich? Because it's usually, it's non-medical supports. So it's things like home-delivered meals, chore services, um, 
home modifications, like building those ramps, transportation. Do you have your CHRs or someone else giving people rides to powwow or ceremony or to the store or to the bank? Those are all waiver type services. Mileage may vary from state to state because the state still controls what services they put in their package and what they will and won't cover. But I promise you that every tribe in the country is providing some kind of long-term service and support, and they're just not calling it that. And so they're just not accessing, getting people enrolled in the programs that would then expand access for elders, but also provide reimbursement to the tribe for the services and allow them to build a more cohesive program. Slide. So there are policy changes and we can use this data to support that um, when we talk about what it means to have self-sustaining tribally administered long-term services and supports. Uh, can you slide? So I talked a bit about the, the waivers. So there are tribal requirements when states file these waivers. So when a state has a Medicaid plan, they have to file that with the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, CMS, at the federal level. And then it's reviewed and it's approved, or it may go back and forth between CMS and the state if there are questions. So the same thing uh, applies for these home and community-based service waivers. Um, and there is a checklist of items of, has the state done these things? And one of those check, and one of the things that isn't on the checklist is are they including tribes as case managers and assessment administration? Now, the reason that's important is this, is that there have been states in the past 10 years who have wanted to actually work with tribes, encouraging them to be providers of these waiver services. And at least one state, that was Wisconsin, wound up in a big back and forth and tug of war with CMS where the state was fined tens of thousands of dollars for actually allowing two different tribes to be waiver agencies. And at the end of more than a year of discussion back and forth with CMS, it was discovered that it really came down to the language in the waiver and the way it was filed. And what was filed and with by the state and approved by CMS did not include tribes as an allowable agency to perform case management and those functional assessments that determine someone's level of need um, and their level of care to allow them to be participating in the waiver. And that was the hill that CMS chose to die on. Rather than walk the state through filing amendment and helping them change that language, CMS simply said, nope, you submitted it to us this way. That's not, you've not listed the tribes as allowable agencies. And so they're not allowable agencies and you're not in compliance um, by allowing them to perform these services. And so we have now fined you. So some states have gotten savvy to that. Minnesota is one of them. Minnesota actually has language in their waiver that says tribes who are contracted with um, the Department of Health Services in Minnesota are eligible to perform these, these duties. But CMS has not done a really good job of outreaching that to states or to tribes so that leadership can turn around and take that up to the very top as a policy issue to say, why isn't language included for states to say you need to look or have you have you worked with tribes to see if they're interested in case management and functional screening assessments and that should be a part of that checklist for filing um also uh, there are requirements for states to comply with tribal magi and estate recovery magi is medicaid adjusted gross income and a state recovery is just what it sounds when someone participates in Medicaid, particularly long-term care, because of the cost of care, usually they sign something that says that, you know, upon their death, that, or the death of a spouse, however things are set up, that the state can recoup part of the cost that they spent on that person's care um, against their estate. So, but there are exemptions for tribal members. If you live on or near the reservation, then, you, then your property is exempt. Um, that tribal Medicaid adjusted gross income also has certain exemptions for tribal members, all to help them qualify for these programs and enroll in them. However, we found that by and large, that most states are not compliant with this because 
all the way at the top, they are unaware of these tribal provisions that have literally been around for decades. That is a policy issue for leadership to be discussing at the highest level. Um, also, the funding to tribes. There, We already said there's no line item for long-term services and supports. Um, the OAA is the Older Americans Act. Currently, uh, that's the primary elder program funding to tribes. In fact, it's the only funding that tribes get that allow them to perform any type of long-term service and support activity like home delivered meals, chore services, uh, tra not uh, transportation that isn't to, to and from a medical appointment that sort of thing. Um, however, the funding formula e was built for states and is population-based. So even though Title VI carves out a niche for tribes that says, hey, you're a sovereign government, we recognize that there's a gap in earlier loss of life, you can serve elders at any age that you, the tribe, determine that you're an elder. Predominantly, that's 55, but there are some tribes that 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 age is down into the 40s because they have such an earlier loss of life and poor health outcomes in their particular community. However, the funding formula to the Older Americans Act first only allows tribes to count people who are age 60 and older. So you have an unfunded mandate that you're allowed to serve the people who are 59 and under, but you're not getting funded for them. And second, you have to have a minimum of 50 people who are 60 and older in order to even qualify for one of those grants. So if you're a smaller tribe, or let's say the tribes that have had now had a significant decrease in, the, in their elder population because of COVID, you may have lost your ability to keep one of these grants if you don't have at least 50 elders who are age 60 and older. Um, and then from there, the funding tiers themselves are based on population numbers. So the, let's just make up a number and say the lowest tier of funding is $5,000 and you have to have between 50 and 100 elders 60 and older to get that 5,000. Then you're not going to go above that 5,000 unless you have 101 to 250 elders and so on and so forth. It's built on state populations. So tribes will never come to meaningful elder care funding with the current Older Americans Act funding formula. Um, also, there's under Title III of the Older American Act, there is a requirement for states to either pay a tribe and contract with them when they're providing services to people 60 and older because elders are entitled to both programs. They're still citizens of the state as well as the tribal nation. So that's a good way for Title VI programs to stretch their dollars is to contract with the state and receive funding for the services they provide to people 60 and older so that they can preserve their limited Title VI dollars for the unfunded people that are under the eight, that are 59 and younger. However, even though there is a requirement that the two programs coordinate and elders are entitled to both sets of services, uh, states uh, have a really poor track record of complying with that and actually giving meaningful funding to tribes or providing the services where a tribe isn't able to provide a certain service, but someone's eligible. And so far, uh, ACL and AOA have done absolutely nothing to enforce compliance. And so there are no penalties for that, but there should be. Um, and then you have uh, the FMAP, which is the Federal Medicaid Assistance Percentage. So whenever you hear politicians talk about the spending in Medicaid and they kind of cry a crocodile tear about, you know, oh, it's going to bankrupt us, know that you need to take that with a mountain of salt because Medicaid is a state and federal partnership. And the most that any state in the entire country pays for their Medicaid budget is 50% they get a minimum of a 50% match and that percentage goes all the way up to 83%. And it's based on, there's an algorithm that's based on state population, um, other things like cost of living and things like that. But the point is, is that states are not footing the bill for all of their Medicaid spending. And when it comes to tribal members, states are able to get back 100% on the dollar of all of their Medicaid spending when services are provided to a tribal member by and through a tribe. 
So it's not just when they come to the tribal clinic or they come to the tribal aging program. It's also when your purchase and referred care program refers elders and other people out if they are Medicaid recipients and there's a little chain. I mean, there's it's a little more complicated, but we only have so much time and that's its own training. <laughs> um, then states are able to recoup that at 100% and have been somewhat quietly recouping that amount since 2013 um, when the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act was permanently reauthorized underneath the Affordable Care Act. But that 100% FMAP was expanded to include long-term care. So there's absolutely no reason for states not to have an incentive to work with tribes to become these provider types and also to share some of that FMAP back because the states can't get the through the tribe without the tribe participating with them to tell them what services and what people it applies to. And so you're really talking about a Medicaid population in long-term care that has should have a zero net impact on the state's bottom line. So then you have cost shares and equal access. So when I've talked so far about how people can still participate in these programs, even if they're over Medicaid income, well, that comes with a little caveat in there. There is a, it is the only cost share that is being applied in Medicaid to tribal members, because otherwise tri tribal members are exempt from any kind of cost share deductible. Um, it's copay. It's actually written in federal law. However, a couple of paragraphs down from that statement is something called the post eligibility treatment of income. And it deals with long term care and it's allowing states to take charge what they call a patient share, which is really a long-term services and supports cost share that acts like a deductible to people who are participating in these programs that they'll be responsible for. Um, it's a huge barrier, especially for elders when they find out that, oh, they qualify for this program, but they're on a fixed income and they're not going to be expected to have a $500 yearly cost share to themselves. Um, and so they just stop right there and don't participate. However, the big question is, is why there's a cost share applied at all? Because the state has no burden of cost because they can get 100% FMAP for all of those people participating in that program. Uh, slide, and I hope that I'm close to done. I'm trying to wrap it up. <laughs> oh, yay, <laughs> we made it. <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> um, no, this is like, this is in the weeds of stuff that I enjoy talking about. And so- um thank you both for that very very quick overview of a very complicated system um I don't know if there are any immediate questions I didn't see anything in the chat but I wanted to give folks a second I know we're right about the hour but if there are any burning questions I would like people to jump in if not one thing I'll highlight too is that we are actually going to um invite these guys back for the next webinar so we can take even a little bit more of a deeper dive i think as you can tell there's a lot of things we can unpack <laughs> and have a conversation about um i really appreciated the conversation about um this movement towards there's authority for long-term support services but there isn't funding um and then just really looking from the patient's perspective on access to these services um, i think that's really really important context especially as we go out and try to do our work you know, which is a little bit more on the research side, but um, those are just the realities of, of receiving care. So we have no questions. Oh, we do have one question really quick. Um, would you be able to talk more about how to increase social interaction for elders experiencing Alzheimer's disease and related dementia? Um, are there programs in place in Indian country? I don't want to line jump if you want to take that, Colette, but I can answer that too. Um, no, you you can answer that one. I mean, the only thing that I can think of is, you know, some of the supports that uh, the BOLD initiative uh, with IA Squared is, is trying to develop for more resources for our elders. So there might be some information and resources, um, you know, that, that provide some suggestions for that. But go ahead, Alina. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm just actually finishing up a project with Great Lakes Intertribal Council in Wisconsin. They've got a program called Together Strong, uh, which is a 
uh, Alzheimer's and dementia related disease grant from the administration of community living. There are currently four or five tribes who are participants in that grant and this would be, um, they should be winding up now. Uh, so, and one of the things that Glitzy has done is created uh, some caregiver guides as well as some manuals for dementia care specialists. So one of the things to increase social interaction is to really be supporting both that person living with dementia and the caregiver to participate in things like memory cafes, um, certain cultural events, get the word out in the community of how to become uh, what we call a dementia friendly tribal community, which is making people more aware of the symptoms of the disease and when somebody might be suffering from it, if they see them out somewhere, um, so that they feel more welcome in the community by making things accessible, like having some quiet spaces and things like that. But a lot of the aging programs are taking on some small steps in that dementia piece. So I would say get with your tribal aging director and see what they're doing for some of that outreach. You can also certainly reach out to um, any of those grantees, like I said, Great Lakes Inner Tribal Council, they're looking at doing some other trainings like that. There's also information on NICOA, the National Indian Council on Aging's website. They have some information on a program called Savvy Caregiver in Indian Country, which is a caregiver training program and talks a bit more about how to increase that interaction for people. Um, some of that is also about just making sure that you keep including people and they're welcome at the table even if they can't completely communicate with you, they can still be what's called contented, have contented involvement. So bring, you know, bring your grandfather out when you're doing, you know, wild ricing activities, or he can sit in the boat while you're fishing. Just being with them is social interaction. And I posted the link for um, IE Squared's Brain Health uh, project, and it has a lot of good information there as well. Oh, and about the funding, I see that question sitting in the chat too. Um, you can, I would check with um, IHS, they have some grants that are coming out. I don't remember if they've already been released that are four tribes. They It's a limited amount, but they were hoping to have at least four or five applicants uh, for these grants that are all around developing uh, dementia programming in the community. There's, uh, like I said, Administration for Community Living had those grants out and specifically two tribes, but all of the other grants for Alzheimer's and dementia within ACL are also available to tribes. They just don't specifically target them the way this last round did. Um, also check again with your aging directors because Title VI does provide does allow you to check literally check a box in your grant and say that you're interested in some of the funds being directed towards dementia care. And then there are some really good programs out there. There's one called I Care, which uh, is was done in Canada, but they are American researchers and they are currently back uh, at the University of Minnesota, but they worked with uh, Ojibwe First Nations there and put together some really good screening tools, assessments um, that are all tribally focused. And those are all free and they're on the eye care website and the eye care has uh, two A's in it. Um, Elena, I forgot to ask, did did you mention the one? I know IHS, um, uh, Jolie Crowder is her name. She's a National Elder Services Consultant for their Elders Program um, uh, Division. And they had actually put out a grant specific for tribes with uh, ADRD, with Alzheimer's and dementia related um, with, with ADRD, I guess. And so, but I think that closed, but I think it's something that they're going to try to keep going and funding. So I can definitely send that information uh, to Cole and Grace, and maybe that could be, be sent out too. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, I see the question about the clinical trials. You know, clinical trials are a tricky thing. Um, there is a lot of inherent 
um, mistrust and bad experiences and trauma um, when it comes to things that look like experiments. So there have been all kinds of discussions around this. And I think it's really, it's, it's tribe by tribe and it's person by person. Um, have I seen anything like a big push in engagements? I have not, but I am not the end all be all expert on that. Colette, you got any comments on that one? Uh, no, not at the moment, sorry. Yeah, I think I can chime in quick before before we wrap up, but I, that's kind of the intent of this project, especially this particular core, is to start having community dialogue and start presenting information and engaging our communities with the ultimate goal of participating more in the clinical side of, of research around Alzheimer's disease, um, just because we know that that's really necessary, um, because we understand so little about what what this disease can do in our you know bodies as native people. <laughs> um, early research is showing that some of the genetic predispositions that we might have, um, which have been tested largely in white communities, that that same um, gene might not present itself the same way in native people. But until we have that participation, until we understand what might be something like a resiliency factor embedded in our genes, we don't know. Um, and so really just underscoring those principles of data sovereignty and, and true community-based um, participatory research and um, connecting with resources too, because the other piece of this, as we've talked about today, is, you know, if someone does get diagnosed, well, then what? You know, we're, we're finding out that getting access to these services requires a lot of, um, you know, jumping through different eligibility criteria and different funding sources. And so, um, again, this, this issue is very, very complex. And I'm personally excited that these guys will be back to take us on another little deep dive and, and increase this conversation as well. Yeah, could I just like give you one one last little nugget there <laughs> is um, there's a study out and I can send the link to Cole and if you guys wanna, wanna pass it around. Um, I worked on a paper with um, the University of Wisconsin-Madison who has uh, a couple of long, long, long standing programs with some of the tribes here in Wisconsin on early detection of Alzheimer's and dementia. That's under uh, Dr. Kerry Gleason. But we did a cost utilization review looking at postpaid claims data for Medicaid recipients in the state of Wisconsin who were either identified as American Indian, Alaska Native, um, Native Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiian, um, as well as looking at some of the clinic data from the tribes, just looking at cost of care. But one of the drivers to that was that prior to that, I'd worked on another on another data project, and we were finding that a lot of Native people were getting diagnosed late because they were being misdiagnosed. Uh, and they were being diagnosed with things like adult failure to thrive. Um, malnutrition, uh, dehydration, altered mental states, and a lot of times would wind up in um, mental health services or social services for something completely different when what they actually had was cognitive decline, the early stages or mid stages of dementia or Alzheimer's, and that IHS um, and actually our PMS so the system that most tribes use that the federal government gave everyone access to that you're having to enter your clinic claims into in order to report back to IHS physically does not have a spot for a cognitive screen. So there's a big problem with being able to access those early screening tools. Um, and we were seeing it play out in the data. And then we were also seeing this wave effect of people would go along through the tribal system, the tribal clinic system where they were comfortable and never get diagnosed until they had what we were calling like a critical mass event, like a problematic behavior or some other medical event. They would pop out of the tribal system into a hospital, emergency room, some other specialty care. That's where they would wind up getting the diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia. But then that that wave would take a dip back down as they went back into the tribal system and continued to manage either at home, um, being very insulated and cared for by their family until they had another one of those events that popped them back out of the system. So there's a lot to look at there. And I, I just wanted to share that little bit with you guys. No, thanks. I think everyone stayed on. So I, they're, they're very, very <laughs> interested. So that's a good, that's always a good sign, right? Um, 
Well, thank you guys again. We will have this recorded and then we will be sending out the announcement for the next webinar, which will happen in a couple months um, to continue this conversation. Um, like I said, thank you guys so much. I'm I'm excited to see um, that people were interested and hung around and asked some questions. So thank you to our attendees and thank you to our hosts and we look forward to the next one. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having us.